Okay, so this semester, our theme is confronting Old Testament controversy. Uh, so to kind of lead into this broadly, our project as, as an organization is to, quote, defend the Christian faith. And usually that involves talking about broad issues like, uh, does God exist? Or um, is the Bible reliable? Things of that nature. For this semester, we're focusing in specifically on those questions related to uh, the Old Testament, and specifically the controversial ones. Things like, there appear to be genocidal things in the Bible, and what's the deal with evolution and creation, and things of that nature. And so if you are here last week, uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Micah Green, uh, kind of gave an overview of how to engage with this issue, particularly through the lens of Christ. Uh, so the general idea is that the uh, Bible is kind of a unified story that all together points to the Messiah, who is Christ, who is God incarnate. Um, but that last week was just kind of a broad overview, and now we're going to start getting into the specifics. And so uh, today we're going to be talking about specifically the text of the Old Testament, um, and primarily the composition of the Old Testament and the textual history uh, of the, uh, the Hebrew Bible. Now, um, the, unlike Dr. Green's talk, I'm not going to make this too much of a lecture, so uh, I have many points in here where I will invite uh, feedback and discussion. Um, and also, for those of you that are in the Zoom, if you would like to uh, comment verbally, I know last week we only did chat. Um, I'm actually going to do this right now. Uh, I'll put my headphone in here so I can hear you um, if you have any uh, comments. Okay? So, for, um, so this isn't really a lecture, and I'm not really an expert. So anyway, so this is going to be our roadmap for today. So there are three broad areas of our discussion. The first is we're going to talk about the nature of the biblical text, things about labels that are applied to the Bible and what they mean. The second is we're going to talk about the actual material contents of the biblical text. Uh, you see that we have this beautiful scroll up here. Well, this isn't the only one in existence, and so we'll talk about some other ones and things that are important. And then lastly, we're going to talk about the composition of the biblical text, which is how did the thing get written in the first place? Okay, so let's start with the nature of the biblical text. So there, the first thing is there are a lot of labels that are given to the Bible. The Word of God is one of them. And these two particular ones, inspired and inerrant. So I want to, uh, to, to take about 10 or 15 seconds and just kind of reflect on that. When I say the Bible is inspired or the Bible is inerrant, I want you to think, what does that mean? Okay, just think about it for a minute while I take a sip of water. Okay, um, would anyone like to give me an answer to what, what you think it means whenever people say the Bible is inspired? And, don't, and please don't raise your hand. This is not class. Just, just uh, say. Okay. Hopefully this doesn't look too weird. Yeah, got all these wires coming out of my head. Look like I'm a part of the Borg or something. Okay, actually this is terrible. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do that later. Okay, any, anybody else have a definition? Okay. I see no one has taken the bait on defining inerrant. It's a big one. Okay, so let's talk about this. So inspired, here's something that's very important, an, an important distinction between these. Inspired is what the Bible says about itself, but inerrant is what uh, some particular people have interpreted inspired to be. The Bible does not use this word inerrant, um, but it does say that it is inspired. So this is the text that a lot of people turn to. That This isn't the only one. Um, but 2 Timothy 3, 16 and following says, All scripture is breathed out by God, Here's the fancy Greek word, theonoustos, and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, that the man of God or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So it is breathed out by God. Another passage is in uh, 2 Peter, which says, men uh, spoke prophecies as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, that doesn't tell you a lot in and of itself, but it does say that in some sense, the life that's in the message of the Bible is from God. Now, another term is the term inerrant, and this is particularly important if you're an evangelical Protestant, uh, because uh, in 1978, there was a, a statement called the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy, 
which has become a staple for evangelical Protestantism. Uh, and it goes as follows. God, well, I'm not going to read the whole thing. The whole thing is like over a thousand words. But here's one very important excerpt. God, who is himself truth and speaks truth only, has inspired Holy Scripture. Holy Scripture, being God's own word, written by men, prepared and superintended by his spirit, is of infallible divine authority in all matters upon which it touches. Being holy and verbally God-given, Scripture is without error or fault in all of its teaching. Now, it's important, again, I'm going to reiterate, inspired is what the Bible says about itself, and inerrant is what uh, inspiration has been interpreted to be. Um, now, I, I mention this because I myself am an evangelical Protestant, so this is kind of an important issue to think through carefully. Um, and it's important to realize that believing inerrancy is not integral or, ne or it's not necessary to be a Christian. You can certainly be a Christian and deny inerrancy. But given its importance, and particularly... Uh, its importance whenever discussing these questions about the composition of the Bible, um, I'll be returning to this as a touch point, okay? So those are two words that are said about that. But here are a few things to ponder as we continue through this discussion. The first one is we've used this word inspired, but how does it work in practice, okay? The statement there, the Chicago statement said, men were superintended by God. But I want you to think for a minute. How does that, what is the causal chain that goes from God to a man in history, to words on paper. The second one is what does the Bible say about its own composition? Not what people say the Bible was uh, put together or how it's put together, but what does the Bible say about its own composition? And then lastly, and this is very important, do our definitions of inspiration and inerrancy reflect the text or do they restrict the text? In other words, are we taking this label inspiration and letting the phenomenon of the text define how we interpret that, or are we saying, this is what inspiration means, and I'm going to force the text into that box? And the same thing goes for the term inerrancy as well. So just think about that. How does inspiration work? What does the Bible say about itself? And do our definitions of these words reflect the text or restrict the text? Okay? All right, so that's a little bit... Oh. One very important clarification about this term inerrancy is that it only applies to the original manuscripts. So this is from Article 10. They affirm that inspiration, strictly speaking, applies only to the autographic, that is, original text of Scripture, which in the providence of God can be ascertained from the available manuscripts. The original things that were written down in the past no longer exist. They've been lost to time. But we have copies, like this copy. Okay? So this obviously leads to the next question. Well, what are these available manuscripts by which we ascertain the original? Um, so our next section is going to be on the contents, and we'll talk a little bit about manuscripts. Uh, but before I do that, let me just ask, are there any comments either here or, I'll put my earpiece in now, uh, from the Zoom uh, regarding this discussion on inspiration and inerrancy? Right, so the Chicago statement is thoroughgoing evangelical Protestant. I will defer to our Catholic members here, because I know we have more than one comment on this. swing is that um, in, the, in the 20th century, several documents came out from the Vatican that um, the original context of scripture should be taken into account when interpreting its meaning. So that generally means that um, that leans on the inspired side versus the inerrant side. So a creation narrative doesn't necessarily need to be taken literally, for instance. It can be taken in its original context, if that original context didn't entail a literal meaning. But you know, granted to say you won't find every Catholic theologian holding the same views about particular passages because the church has been around for 2,000 years. So, you know, for instance, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas held different views about the text than modern scholars might. And that doesn't mean that their views are wrong from a Catholic perspective. It just means that they lived in a different time of church history, but still within the broad definition that the Catholic Church offers. Okay. What I Parable doesn't have to be literal fact. 
OK. So for those in the Zoom, I've been asked to kind of summarize this discussion. Uh, the best way that I would summarize it is that inspiration is something that all Christian groups will agree to. But the specific inference from inspiration to inerrancy is something that only uh, evangelical Protestants have specifically done and have specifically claimed uh, that, that term. OK. So um, with that, uh, so let's talk a little bit about these available manuscripts that are around. Um, Let's see here. OK, uh, and our primary source is this book here. It's called A Student's Guide to Textual Criticism. Highly recommend. Very good. Um, and uh, before we get into this discussion, we need two important clarifications. So the first one is to define what textual criticism is as a discipline. Um, taken straight from Wikipedia, textual criticism is a branch of scholarship, uh, f uh, philology, and literary criticism concerned with the identification of textual variants in a manuscript. So whenever you make two copies of a text, there are going to be differences. Textual criticism is the way that you evaluate uh, those differences and variances. This is extremely important. Old Testament textual criticism is not in any way, well, except maybe a little bit, the same as New Testament textual criticism. When we talk about the Bible, what we mean is 39 books of the Old Testament, kind of all grouped together in their own thing. 27 books of the New Testament, they're their own thing. And then there's another set of books that... Uh, two-thirds of the church also include in that, and they're their own thing. But the rules by which all of these groups of books were made are different. They vary between the books themselves, and they vary across their specific groupings. In particular, the languages is probably the single biggest one. Uh, the Hebrew Bible was written in Hebrew, whereas the majority of the uh, New Testament is written in Greek. The time periods are radically different. The time periods over which they were written, the oldest parts of the Old Testament, are upwards of 1200 B.C., 1200 or older BC, and the newest parts to 500. That's a gap, a minimum gap of 700 years. The entire New Testament was written in less than 100. Radically different. So the reason I bring this up is that sometimes in apologetics, people get really sloppy, and they'll talk about textual criticism of the Old Testament, and then just say, well, it's the same for the New Testament. And those inferences do not carry over. So we're specifically going to be talking about the rules for the Old Testament. And the second thing is that we're going to get rid of this term, the Old Testament, because that is a very pejorative and lame term. Why would we say old? There's nothing old about it. So um, instead, we're going to use this term. It is called Tanakh. This is what the Hebrew people use, or the Jewish people. And it comes from an abbreviation from Torah, Nevim, and Ketuvim. First five books of the Bible being called the Torah, Torah scroll. Another group called the Nevim, or the prophets. And uh, Ketuvim is just a collection of writings. Um, the contents of this book, just as a footnote, these are the same as the Protestant Old Testament, so it does not include the deuterocanonical books. But we'll, we'll talk about that later in the semester. It's not a big deal. Okay, um, moving quickly, the text types of the Tanakh, or Hebrew Bible. There are four that are in Hebrew, and there are five important translations. We're not going to talk about all of that. We'll just talk about two Hebrew versions and one very important translation. The first and most significant uh, version of the Hebrew Bible is the Masoretic text. It gets its name from the Masoretes, which was a group of scribes that transmitted the uh, text from between about 500 AD to 1100 AD. It's written in a block Hebrew script, and it is the primary textual basis of modern Bibles. Uh, but more so than that, Codex Leningradensis, which is a specific copy of uh, the Hebrew Bible, uh, dates to about 1008 AD, is the single best attested copy of the Masoretic text. In fact, if you pick up a Bible today, 98% of the Old Testament translation is just a translation of literally this codex. Another one is Codex Aleppo. That's the second best one. Um, unfortunately, 40% of it was lost in uh, the 1940s during a, a, a very unfortunate riot. This is what Codex Leningradensis looks like on the cover. It's got a nice little Star of David. And uh, we'll be coming back to this in a bit. Um, so let's put this on. Oh, here's a close-up. This is what the uh, block text looks like. You'll notice um, the, the, if you've ever seen Hebrew before, this is probably the type of Hebrew you've seen. It's very blocky. And you'll notice on the tops and bottoms of it, uh, there are these little marks. Um, these are vowel points, which was an innovation by the Masoretes. Uh, Hebrew doesn't actually have vowels the same way that English does. So uh, that was an innovation. And if you want a really close-up look, you can look at this scroll up here, which I don't know if I've mentioned we've had this. Um, and I'll tell you a brief excursus um, on this particular one. Uh, this scroll here is from about 1750, uh, so it's not particularly useful for textual criticism purposes, uh, considering Leningradensis is considerably older. Um, and this scroll was actually rest rescued from Kristallnacht. Uh, that was a very, very tragic event um, in 1938, uh, whenever there were thousands of um, Jewish businesses um, and uh, 
artifacts, and in particular, several hundred uh, synagogues were destroyed by enraged uh, Germans during the uh, rise of Hitler's power. Um, and this was one of the scrolls that was uh, fortunately spared from that. Um, and I, it's really unknown how exa what exactly its history was uh, during that. At some point, it ended up in the hands of some uh, donors who made it here, um, who donated it to uh, to Rocio Christi. And um, importantly, uh, this has been declared unclean or pasul is the term for it, which is why we're allowed to use it. Uh, but we ask that you don't touch it. But you can look at it if you want. And this text, of course, being from 1750, is itself the, a version of the Masoretic text. So you can get a real close look up uh, uh, later. Okay. Yeah, what's up? Uh, this is a question. I'm sorry if this puts you on the spot. But can you think of any good examples for our Protestant listeners of something in Christianity that could be made unclean by desecration? I was having trouble earlier thinking that. I can think of plenty of Catholic examples, but I can't think of any Protestant examples. Of unclean? Thing. Yeah. Uh, where, can't, where it can no longer be used in liturgy because it has been damaged. I don't think so. Not, not that I know of, at least. Uh, there aren't many things that are declared clean or unclean um, in Protestantism, yeah. period. I mean, uh, some of the uh, like Lutheran groups maybe, but definitely not in my tradition. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. So let's summarize this by uh, putting up a little timeline. So we've got 1200 BC over here all the way over to 1000 AD. And this is some uh, important Hebrew history. Moses, the latest date that he's dated to is around 1250 BC. And the Masoretes are over here in 500 uh, AD. And so let's put our manuscripts up there. Wow, they're really late, aren't they? So these texts, as well as they're documented, they hit a brick wall at 500 AD. So what's going on before then? You know, is that literally the case that we can only know the text to 500 years after Christ? That seems very problematic. And up until 1947, that was the case, um, which leads to our next very important discovery. So this right here is a cave uh, in Qumran, which is a region near the Dead Sea in uh, uh, Palestine. And um, in the 1940s, there were a couple of shepherds that were wandering around in there. Stories differ. And uh, basically, they stumbled across these earthenware pots. And inside of them, they found some manuscripts. Uh, didn't think too much about it at the time. One thing led to another. Wonderful weasel phrase. And eventually, these uh, 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 scraps of, uh, or sorry, fragments of manuscripts were identified to be uh, biblical manuscripts. And more specifically, um, it was identified to be uh, what it was later identified as the, what's called the Great Isaiah Scroll. It was a nearly complete copy of the entire book of Isaiah, dated to about 200 BC. Um, and as uh, throughout the 1950s, numerous archaeologists went in and uh, excavated the rest of these caves, and they discovered. Uh, many, many, many more fragments, and uh, by the end of it, they discovered that every biblical uh, book, with the exception of Esther, uh, had some fragment or copy or attestation within this collection of manuscripts. And all of them were dated to within uh, 350 BC at the very earliest and 100 AD at the very latest. Uh, and they were also written in a mixture of Paleo-Hebrew and uh, Block Hebrew script. So there are some very, very old fragments here. Um, Here's another close-up picture here. Uh, this is from uh, the book of Genesis. And if you look really closely, you'll notice that there aren't vowel points on the top and bottom of them. So you can see that these are pre-Masoretic texts in particular. And so this was significant because basically overnight, textual criticism shifted by about a 1,000 years. Uh, and for that reason, this has largely been considered one of the greatest uh, archaeological discoveries of the 20th century. Um, but you're thinking probably, well, what's the big deal? Did it actually work? Did, it, was, what, did they match up? How does it differ from the Masoretic text? Um, well, it turns out that it's a complicated question. For the most part, the overwhelming majority of the manuscripts, particularly the Isaiah scroll, matches, for all intents and purposes, as far as we're concerned, it's basically an exact copy of the Masoretic text, or it's a proto-Masoretic text. Again, they don't have the vowel points. Uh, so the variation is basically negligible. Now, there are about 55 of these texts that have been identified as, um, I think it's non-congruent, or sorry, non-aligned is what this gentleman uh, says here. Uh, there are about 55 of them that they can't identify uh, with the Masoretic text or uh, some other identified Hebrew line. Um, some people make a big deal about it. Other people don't. This guy, Anthony Ferguson, wrote his entire dissertation on it. It's 600 pages long. 
It's called a comparison of the non-aligned text of Qumran and the Masoretic text. And it's, um, it's 600 pages long. So, I mean, it's, he goes through all of these examples if, you, if you're really, really interested. The overwhelming majority of them are just morphological uh, differences, spelling differences and things of that nature. So, um, the long of it is, is that the Qumran text, for by and large, testify to a text that's basically the same as the Masoretic text. Uh, some people make a big deal about this, like, wow, this is an amazing discovery. All it means is that we're really confident in the text of the Hebrew Bible. So, interesting, isn't it? The exciting thing is discovering nothing. Uh, the last one to talk about very quickly is the Septuagint. This is a Greek translation of the Old Testament that was used by the Alexandrian Jews in 250 BC, um, and it was also used by the early Christians. Importantly, if you read a New Testament and it's quoting the Old Testament, it's quoting the Septuagint. So you'll see some differences uh, every once in a while. Um, so let's put that on our timeline real quick. So with everything all together, this is basically what uh, the picture that you can see. Um, we, as far as the text of the Hebrew Bible goes, the brick wall is now 250 uh, BC. So that's basically what uh, we're talking about. And whenever the Chicago Statement talks about the, um, uh, the available manuscripts, this is basically what they mean by that. Okay? So next we'll talk about what happened before 250 BC. Because once you get past 250 BC, you're no longer talking about the copying of the text. You're actually talking about the composition of the text, uh, which is a different question in and of itself. So um, let me just pause here and uh, ask if there are any comments or questions or input or anything like that. Go ahead. Do you know the contents of the silver amulets? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the silver amulets are two, uh, it's literally just two necklaces that were found from 700 BC, and it's just two verses. It's the benediction from Numbers, may the Lord bless you and keep you and let his face shine upon you, uh, the equivalent of finding a bracelet. Um, well, once you get to the exile period in 587, uh, that was whenever the textual transmission became a really big deal uh, because um, of, well, there are a variety of reasons for that. Uh, historically, the Torah observance became, uh, uh, you know, Jews are known as people of the book and all that. That really became a big deal uh, during, during the exile and following. Any other comments or input or anything? Okay. So now our next question is going to be on the uh, composition of the biblical text. Okay. So let me ask you a question. How was the Bible written? So the first thing, we know it's inspired, so it's going to start with God, right? That's our first thing. Okay. So what happens next? Well, simple, right? We go straight to the authorized King James Version of the Bible. No intermediate steps. Okay. Sorry, bad joke. Okay, so let's probe deeper into this arrow. <laughs> All right, so whenever we get to this, the, the first thing to, to point out is that um, the Hebrew Bible, the entire Bible is a collection of books, but the Hebrew Bible is also a collection of books that were transmitted over a long period of time to the point where the transmission, the copying, and the composition are almost indistinguishable from one another. Or they don't, they're not indistinguishable, sorry, they blur together. Um, and every once in a while, we will get a book that tells us a little bit about how it was made. So I'm going to talk about two very important case studies. The first is the book of Jeremiah, because it tells us a little bit about its composition. And the second is the Pentateuch, partially because it's here. Again, here, please see it. And the second thing um, is that this is where the majority of scholarship has been focused on. The, the composition of the Pentateuch, also known as the Torah, is a pretty complicated ordeal. So uh, we'll look into this. Okay, so let's start with uh, the book of Jeremiah. So it's the book of Jeremiah. So we go God, Jeremiah, book of Jeremiah as we have it today. It's closer to reality, right? Uh, so let's probe into these arrows, okay? So I'm going to read this. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to go to chapter 36 of the book of Jeremiah so you can read all of the details. Um, but uh, I will, I'll read this out um, just so that we're, we're all on the same page. So first in chapter 1, the very, very first beginning of Jeremiah, He's called during the reign of Josiah. Um, so that's uh, about 627 B.C., all right? And then in chapter 36, um, it says here, in the fourth year of King Jehoiakim, son of Josiah of Judah. So this is about 20 years after the reign of uh, Josiah started. 
This word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you from the day I first spoke to you from the days of Josiah until today. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, and Baruch wrote on a scroll at Jeremiah's dictation all the words of the Lord that he had spoken to him. And so then they take this scroll and they deliver it to King Jehoiakim. And uh, as the king's assistant, Jehudai, read three or four columns of the scroll, King Jehoiakim would cut them off with a penknife and throw them into the fire until the entire scroll was consumed in the fire. Some more stuff happens. Jeremiah is not happy about this. The, God is not happy about this either. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Take another scroll and write on it all the former words that were in the first scroll with which King Jehoiakim of Judah has burned. Then Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to Neri, uh, gave it, sorry, gave it to Baruch, the scribe, and he wrote on it at Jeremiah's dictation all the words of the book that the, uh, the Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned. He also added to these words many similar words. Okay, so let's do a little chart here. So God comes to Jeremiah and says, orally, preach my word, in 627. He comes back about 20 years later, now write all that down. So Jeremiah hires a scribe named Baruch, then they generate scroll one. Scroll one is delivered to King Jehoiakim. He is not amused. He throws it into the fire. God comes back, says, write down another scroll. So he goes back to Baruch, and they generate scroll number two. But this time, Baruch adds many similar words in addition to the words that were on the first scroll. Okay? So now, the only reason we know about this is because it's written on a third scroll, right? So that means we actually have at least three scrolls in the picture. So, my question, what is the original manuscript in this? And secondly, what is inspired? Is it scroll one that was burned? Is it scroll two? Or is it scroll three that we're reading? And now consider this. We don't have that scroll. That scroll has been copied and copied and copied. What we're reading is Codex Linen Gradensis, right? So when we talk about original manuscript, we can see just from the Bible's own testimony about itself in this one book that that is already a very complicated question, right? So the answer to this, or I, I, I think the best answer to this is to answer it with a question. When you look over here on the left and you see all of these, you know, flow chart and all this, and I left out a lot of stuff for simplicity, but just ask yourself, at what time in this process did God lose interest in preserving his word? At what time did he say, eh, whatever, I'm going to just let this be its own thing? So for that reason, I think it's perfectly fine to say that inspiration, first of all, is involved in this whole process, which leads to the inference that inspiration is not an event, but it's in a process. It involves multiple people. It includes God, it includes Jeremiah, it includes Baruch, and it also includes the scribe that we never knew about and whose name we'll probably be, never know that wrote it down on this third scroll that compiled the annals of Jeremiah and told his story. Was he inspired? I think he was. So the, I think the first thing to, to point out, uh, at all this is just to say that inspiration is not a simple God zaps your brain and then you write a book. So comments? I like how the words that the scribe wrote into the manuscript. Would that be considered inspired? I, I mean, I would say so. I think everything in that red box there would be considered inspired. Mm -hmm. Those are all inspired, or is there something else going on? Or like yeah, that, that's an interesting question. So the, the thing there is they are inspired insofar as they are uh, reflective of, the, of what they're translating, right? So I think that would be the best. Oh, sorry, the audience is asking here. The question was, um, given the millions of versions that we have, the KJV, the ESV, the RSV, et cetera, are all of those inspired as well? Um, and that's an interesting question uh, because it does seem that at some point, like if I made a translation of the Bible, it's not going to be inspired because I only speak English. So anything that I translate is going to be garbage. So at some point, you're going to have to say that there's probably some, at, at some point, human error could potentially overcome it. Uh, but given the message that is written on the scrolls and given the message that is transmitted uh, uh, effectively, um, I think that's fine to say that that's inspired. In other words, the, um, the, uh, 
the inspiration is what is preserved, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. If that's the case, why is there so much, in, so much interest in textual criticism to get back to the original text if the transmission is also inspired? No, 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 that, that was the exact opposite conclusion. The, the transmission is not inspired. The transmission is only good insofar, it's, it's a two-step process. The, te the original text, whatever we mean by that, and it's multiplicitous, because here it's hard to say what the original is. But once you get past that point and start the transmission of copying and copying and copying, that process is not necessarily <coughs> inspired. Um, we're just making the factual claim that human beings are really good at copying down texts. Uh, and whenever they're not good at copying down texts, we have um, methods for determining where their mistakes were. And that's what textual criticism is about. It's, it's saying that any copy is going to have human error introduced, but we have corrective methods for that. And then the, the, the second comment is to say that, however, those errors, even though there are errors, they're so minor that they're not actually going to mar the, uh, the truth of the text, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, what's up? I know this isn't Old Testament, but then if, like, assuming that philosophy in Mark, the last couple verses of Mark, I think the last ten talking about the resurrection, mm -hmm. aren't in the, in the first discovered copies of the book of Mark. So, like, yeah. how does that correlate with something like that? Yeah, that's an, that's an excellent question. So the question's about the long ending of Mark, and, and there are, like, three, I think, three versions. Uh, and this actually goes back to the original point, which is to say, the textual criticism of the New Testament and the Old Testament are not the same. And this is one particular issue or uh, uh, instance of that. Because when it comes to, so let me make a very technical point here. So te the goal of textual criticism in Old Testament studies is not the same as the goal in New Testament studies. In New Testament studies, we are talking about the originals because we are relatively confident that there is an original copy of Mark that was circulated and an original copy of Luke. And Obviously, there are original copies of the Pauline letters because he had to send them. So whatever he sent, that is the original. So the goal of New Testament studies is, let's get back to the original. The Old Testament uh, compositional history is so different, though, that that goal is not, it's, first of all, it's not sure that there is anything that can reasonably be called an original. We'll get to that in a, in a, in a second here. And secondly, um, the, for that reason, the goal of Old Testament textual criticism is in fact to uh, try to determine what the original for what's called a textus receptus, or that is a received text. So in this case, um, in, for the Old Testament, that is the Masoretic text. All Old Testament textual criticism is done by referencing the Masoretic uh, text and seeing how different things are uh, relevant to it. For the Jewish people, the Masoretic text is the text. Like, that's it, if, if that makes sense. Um, and incidentally, that is one of, the re one of the critiques I have about the Chicago Statement, because when they say that inspiration only applies to the originals, that term original is so hard to pin down, especially when it comes to the Old Testament. All right, great, great comments. Um, hey, hey oh, Zach. Sorry, one more, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I'm destroying stuff. Okay, what's up? No, no, actually it's, it's more than that. It's, it's saying like um, there are many candidates for an original. It's not that we don't know it, because we have, we have a text called the Book of Jeremiah, which is a compilation of the story, prophecy, history, life, and death of Jeremiah. And that's what we're referencing whenever we're talking about the Book of Jeremiah. Yeah. Hmm. That's that's almost a perfect segue because I was going to talk about the, the the Pentateuch because this is where it gets. Once you talk about the Torah, these issues are really complicated. Jeremiah. The only reason we have this conversation is because Jeremiah itself gives us a window into its background. So the question is is now being asked what's going on behind the scenes in all these other books. Um, and I think, just to reiterate my, my point in all this, is not to say that we don't know what the original is. The point is, the term original doesn't really have a reasonable meaning in this context. Um, 
because if, you, if you're literally talking about the original, you're talking about this scroll that was burned. But obviously that's not what is meant by the spirit of the Chicago Statement. It's not, meant with, it's not what people mean when they say the original. Um, and the second uh, point is that um, inspiration doesn't stop with that first scroll. Inspiration carries on throughout the entire process of Jeremiah talking with Baruch, and they work together to communicate to the king, and then eventually the later scribe that comes along and takes Jeremiah's oracles and history and puts those together. That whole process is inspired, which is a separate thing from textual transmission. So the second question, though, or, or sorry, the, the, the second case study here is actually the Pentateuch, because this is where people get really upset uh, and uh, really heated, too, about um, compositional uh, questions. Um, but let me check with the... Zoom, apparently we have a comment in the Zoom. Did, uh, someone in the Zoom. Hey, Zach. Can you hear me? Was there a comment from the Zoom? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, just wanted to be make a point to be clear. Uh, the The doctrine of inspiration covers not just the direct quotations from God, but also the people that God was working through. Mm -hmm. So the illustration about Baruch, it, it's not an issue no more than, than Paul or Peter or any of the other writers in the New Testament were an issue. Uh, because the, the doctrine teaches, and there's a good amount of biblical support, that it's not, it's the, yes, the direct quotations from God, but it's also what the people were saying. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, the little book of Jude, verse three, he says, I sat down to write one thing, but I felt compelled to write something else. So we see inspiration happening right there, right, right before our eyes. Mm -hmm. And there's a good double handful of places in the New Testament where Paul and the other writers say, God, we are giving you God's words. Mm -hmm. uh, we, this is God's word. But at the same time, Paul couldn't remember who he baptized. So the doctrine of uh, inspiration is uh, working through people and it has both the human factor and the divine factor uh, together. Mm. All right, thank, thank you. Um, it's a little awkward conversation here to just sit here in silence while I listen to that. <laughs> but so I'll, I'll repeat what the, the comment was. So in summary, it's that uh, for clarity, yes, inspiration um, covers the, uh, not just the texts or the words from God's metaphorical mouth, not the words directly from God, but all of the people involved in the process of uh, composing a biblical book. So it includes uh, Jeremiah, it includes Baruch, it includes Paul, it includes uh, his uh, um, scribe uh, that he had, I forgot what his name was, um, and there are other passages as well, as well that testify to this same thing um, of people, uh, authors of the book, also using other people to kind of bring it together. Okay, and so the second case study that we'll talk about where we'll do direct application for the Old Testament is the question of the Pentateuch or sometimes called the Torah. I'm gonna to use the Pentateuch for a very specific reason, uh, and you'll see why in a minute. So we begin now with our you know, graph. So God spoke to Moses, right? Moses wrote the Pentateuch, and all of Gen uh, Genesis to Deuteronomy as we have it today. Okay, well, clearly there's gonna be some modification here, so let's probe into the arrows. So the first thing is, why do people think that Moses wrote the Pentateuch? And basically it's because the Pentateuch says it, or in other parts of the Bible testify to this too. Exodus 24, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Second Kings, uh, God says, if only they will be careful and uh, do all that, that I have commanded according to the law that my servant uh, Moses commanded. Um, and then, of course, in the New Testament, Jesus says, uh, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Uh, and Paul, of course, says Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandment shall live by faith. But he goes on to say that the, uh, the Bible says instead that the, um, um, sorry, uh, I said that backwards. Uh, Moses writes about the righteousness based on the law that uh, the person who does the commandments will live, but the righteous shall live by faith. That's what I was trying to say um, in uh, Romans 10. So those are reasons for thinking that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Uh, but if we read the first five books of the Bible, we see some suspicious things, such as Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone on the face of the earth. Moses, or Moses, a servant of the Lord, died, and no one knows where he is buried to this day. Moses. 
or there has not arisen a prophet since then, like Moses, Moses. So these are questions. Yeah, so these are all question marks. And um, the traditional answer, well, uh, 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 the traditional answer is just, okay, obviously if Moses writes 95% of the book and someone says he died, that's not a big deal, right? Um, we'll talk a little more about the traditional answers in a minute, um, but I want to talk about some of the non-traditional responses. Uh, there are other questions, too, that don't necessarily get covered by this. For example, the phrase, to this day, is throughout the entire Pentateuch at numerous points, uh, even into the book of Joshua. So even if you say, oh, well, Joshua wrote it, why would Joshua in his own book say, to this day? So there's some type of editorial updating after the fact. Uh, and the more, I think, troubling one is the laws in the Bible that uh, the parallel laws in Exodus and Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers as well, they talk about the same thing, but they reflect different contexts. Some of them ref reflect a wilderness context. Some of them reflect a settled in the land context. If you remember the biblical story, Moses doesn't make it into the land. So how can he be writing a law that reflects a time of people being settled in the land? Again, there are traditional responses to that, but it's just a question mark in your head. Um, and then the last one is different cultural context. Genesis 1 through 11 is flavored in an extremely Mesopotamian way. You read it in parallel with Babylonian texts, and you can see a lot of common touch points between the two, whereas the book of Exodus is filled with Egyptian loan words. It seems very odd that uh, a book the, the first part of the book would be Mesopotamian in nature, and you, then all of a sudden it switches to Egyptian. Uh, we'll actually be talking about these next week uh, on the Genesis 1 through 11, and uh, the Exodus will be in uh, three weeks. So more on that. I know that uh, some of you are really curious about the details. So this is what has led to, so like I said, there are traditional responses to this um, that people uh, who think that Moses wrote every word of the Pentateuch have given. Um, I'm going to leave those in, on the back burner for right now because I want to tell you about the foil for the conversation, which is this guy, Julius Wellhausen, and his idea of JEDP. And I'm sure some of you might have heard of this before. So this guy... In the 19, or, sorry, in 1878, wrote this book with that title, with those words, um, and basically made, he synthesized the idea that had been going on in critical scholarship up to that period, that basically Israel's religion, like all things, started from a simple uh, free religion, and then it evolved and became more complex over time into this highly structured, uh, centralized religion. And so, why would you have these super sophisticated law codes uh, way, way in the back of the Bible. That's just early in Israel's history. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And so he instead uh, took a couple of different ideas and synthesized them into uh, the central thesis. The Pentateuch is not written by Moses. Um, it was actually a compilation of four non-contemporary sources that largely contradict with each other. The first one uh, is the Yahwist, which was made in seven, uh, 700s BC. Um, the second is uh, the Eloist in about 900s BC or so. And uh, basically what he, one of the facts that I didn't mention earlier is that if you read the Pentateuch in, in Hebrew, as I do all the time, right? Like, who doesn't do that? Uh, you'll notice that the name of God switches back and forth between Yahweh uh, and Elohim. And so he thought that's probably two sources that used uh, the Yahweh term, the covenant name of the God of Israel, and Elohim, the more generic term, and that they had been sort of mushed together. Um, that was his central thesis. You also had the Deuteronomist who wrote Deuteronomy as well as some other history books, and then the priest who did all the law codes in Leviticus. And then at some time around like the 400s or 500s, maybe even the 300s, this all got woven together into the Pentateuch. Again, you can see the Pentateuch up here. Um, this is what it looks like nowadays. This theory has gone through a lot of changes since 1878. It's really like the version, the 1878 version is like ridiculous at this point. No one takes it seriously. But the, the general thesis is kind of the same you have these different sources called JEDP, and they've been merged together. Um, so let's put that on the timeline. So you can see here that, again, this doesn't quite, you know, this doesn't match uh, very well with uh, uh, traditional hypotheses. Um, so this leads to a dilemma, all right? Because like we said, our first view is that Moses wrote every single word of the Pentateuch as we have it today, including his own death, including his own humility, including prophecies of the future, including law codes in places that he had never been. Or our alternative, Moses wrote none of those things and most likely didn't exist, and all of this was created by four anonymous sources across a vast uh, period of time. So of this binary, which is logically exhaustive, which one are you going to take? Okay, 
So obviously, okay. So clearly, clearly this is a false dichotomy, right? So there's a massive spectrum of views that, that are in between these. Uh, and even just trying to survey these would take a long time. Uh, so I'm just gonna give you uh, one suggestion here. And so I'm gonna return back to our idea about inerrancy, um, which is of this spectrum of views, where, where w if you care about inerrancy, if you find that important, as again, evangelical Protestant, I'm sorry, I find this important, where would this, like, where do we draw the line, the inerrancy line, all right? Um, and, I'm sorry? Bluish purple over here? Maybe, maybe here, maybe here, okay. <laughs> So um, I think the important thing is let's see what inerrancy actually commits us to. If we're committed to inerrancy, what does inerrancy commit us to? Um, and essentially, the, the statement says that um, we deny the legitimacy of the treatment of the text uh, that finds sources behind the text that leads to rejecting the text claims of authorship. In other words, long story short, what the Bible says about its own authorship is what's true about its authorship. So that leads to the next question is, what does the Bible say about its authorship? And importantly, this idea that Moses wrote every single word of the Pentateuch is in fact not in the Bible. That is a Talmudic tradition that was developed by the Jewish people. And while I respect the Jewish people, I do not ascribe inerrancy to the Talmud. There are a lot of things in there that would question that. And so the, the important thing to do is on a close reading of the Bible, we do not actually see anything where the law of Moses, definitely in the Old Testament, references anything, for example, in the book of Genesis. At no point is anything in the book of Genesis referred to as the law of Moses. There's one possible one in the New Testament. We'll come to that one in a minute. But there's nothing in the Old Testament that says that. Now, of course, the patriarchal stories are known. It's not like ex Genesis was just created ex nihilo, but there's nothing in there that attributes that. And secondly, there's nothing in the Hebrew Bible that, importantly here, unambiguously uses this phrase, law of Moses, comprehensively for the entire five books of the Pentateuch. So why would we feel committed to say that Moses wrote every single word of the Pentateuch if the Bible doesn't seem to be committed to saying that about itself? So here's just one hypothesis, one possible hypothesis. I don't even think this is true, but this is just one possible way of thinking about it that is consistent with, I think, inerrancy and consistent with the data and doesn't commit you to either one of those extremes. So the first one is to say that Israelites before Moses preserved the patriarchal traditions of Abraham and Isaac, etc., through oral history or there are other theories about cuneiform texts and things of that nature. But think about this for a minute. Before Moses, Moses was not an eyewitness to anything in the book of Genesis. I know that there are some creationists who would uh, take a view of Genesis 1 and possibly say it was an eyewitness. That's a different view. Talk about that next week. Um, but you have to consider that people before Moses were preserving these traditions. So if Moses writes down those traditions, or if a guy after Moses writes down those traditions, what difference does it make? It's not Moses creating those stories. It's other people anyway. So as long as they're faithfully preserved, does that really matter? And again, the Bible doesn't actually say Moses wrote down the patriarchal narratives. The second thing is, this is just more of a practical reflection, but if Moses is leading the people out of Egypt, he's leading them across the desert, He's trying to judge rightly amongst all these people, and he's trying to get them into the promised land. He's dealing with all their grumblings. Just read the book of Numbers. When is he going to have time to sit down and write down an autobiography and make it in the beautiful prose that the Hebrew Bible, or that the uh, Pentateuch is in? Just practically, it seems kind of odd that he would do that. So how about this? How about one of his associates? kept really good detailed notes, or even took Moses' own notes and compiled them all together to record the events of Moses' life and his leadership period, everything from the Exodus up to Sinai and everything through the wilderness, and wrote all that down. Someone like Joshua, hypothetically. And that, um, secondly, let's say that number, uh, whenever we're, we talk about the law codes that are different between the wilderness and the settled uh, um, case, that leaves us with Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. And that means that they're hybrid. So parts of it are directly from the hand of Moses, probably the version of the Ten Commandments in Exodus. In fact, actually, just read uh, the Ten Commandments in Exodus and the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy. Um, and you'll see that there are differences between them. So possibly the Exodus version is directly from the hand of Moses, um, but parts of it are people in the Mosaic tradition, perhaps the uh, judges that he trained 
that were adapting the mosaic material and composing new material to reflect the occupancy of the land because that occupancy necessitated adaptation of the law, just as exile necessitated adaptation of the law later, many, many years later. I mean, Judaism today and Judaism during Moses' time are not even close to the same thing. But because the material encompasses times, needs, customs from the Mosaic period all the way up into the United Monarchy, Moses, the law, the deliverance from Egypt, the events at Sinai, all of these are constant touch points, and they are historical real events that are inspiring the text. So that's properly labeled the law of Moses. And then lastly, we talk about Genesis 1 through 11. Um, maybe that's preserved along with the patriarchal narratives, or even more provocatively, maybe uh, that was the last bit that was added during the Babylonian exile. Uh, the Hebrew people were suddenly confronted with all of this, uh, a, a new environment that they had to deal with, and they needed uh, a new composition for a new uh, situation. So that's where their creation uh, stories took their final form, and that's why they're so Mesopotamian flavored. Now, is this true? Almost certainly not. Every single line item on here is questionable at some point along the data. But is it plausible? Yeah, I think something in the broad outline of something like this is acceptable. Is this consistent with inerrancy? Absolutely. Nothing about this really denies the, the Bible's claims about itself. So, uh, this is not really helpful. Okay, and that's not helpful either. Okay, so, so this, is, this is basically a summary of everything that we've talked about uh, up until now. Um, and I just put this on here uh, to show you that the supplementary hypothesis, as you can see, is radically different than the Wellhausen view because it takes seriously, as a starting point, the Bible's claims about its own composition. And yet you can see that the end point is pretty similar. You have the final version of the Torah being brought together in maybe 500 BC, maybe 300 or so BC. But you can see that the data is being synthesized in a way that is respectful to the Bible's claims and is also within the bounds of inerrancy. So when we say this phrase, Moses wrote the Torah or the law of Moses, um, it's important not to stretch that so far that we're committed to uh, Moses writing literally every single word of the Pentateuch. Now on that, that is a traditional view, and there are Christians who believe that, and there are arguments in favor of that. The simple one is to say, well, um, of course everybody in the, uh, or, uh, you know, Moses was a prophet, so he could prophesy the future uh, uh, residency in the land and, and things of that nature. Um, but I think the important point is, if you do not find those arguments convincing, which frankly I do not find them convincing, I don't think it's necessary to feel like you have to give up on inerrancy or give up on mosaic authorship either. So, um, with that, quick summary of everything that we've talked about. The Bible is inspired. Inspiration is a process that involves many people. Um, the Bible is claimed to be inerrant, uh, which means that it's true in all that it teaches, insofar as uh, that is represented by the available manuscripts. The available manuscripts that we have are the Masoretic text and the Qumran texts, which testify to a pretty robust tradition of text uh, that goes back to about 250 BC. And the composition of the text is fairly complicated um, and non-homogeneous, uh, but when we take seriously what the Bible says about itself, uh, we're able to synthesize that data in a way that's sensible. So um, let me just pause for a minute and see if there are any comments or questions. And if not, I'll give you all a chance to look at this scroll here. So, uh, any comments or questions or input on anything that we've discussed today? Or anything we didn't discuss today? And again, don't raise your hand. Just, just say it. Okay, on the oral history, because that cover, probably covered a lot more years, but even the New Testament, uh, even some New Testament, I think like 1 Corinthians 15, they said that you know, that was an oral church, you know, something the church said that yeah. was oral history uh, first before it was ever written down. So, you know, there's an, you can't hand wave away the fact that oral history is a real thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. The, uh, and for those in the Zoom, the question was about the importance of oral history. And it's important to point out that most of, uh, most of the people involved in this history couldn't read. Uh, so you're going to have uh, means of transmission of the truth through non-textual uh, non means, um, whether it's oral or otherwise. Any other comments or questions about this?
what some people consider like the original text of the Bible. Um, there are some denominations of the church who still Yeah, so that the question is, are there texts outside of uh, what we would call the Bible that other denominations use? Um, and that question is very broad and can apply to at least three things. Uh, so the first one is there's a debate between uh, Catholics and Protestants over the deuterocanonical books. Uh, I'm going to screw up. I think it's seven of them, uh, seven or eight. Seven, seven thank you. Uh, um, and those are books like uh, Tobit, um, Sirach, um, Bell and the Dragon, some other things like that. Um, and interestingly, those books were circulated along with the, uh, the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish scriptures, in the Septuagint. So one of the, there are many reasons why they later were considered canonical by the, the uh, Catholic Church. Um, but one of the main reasons was because uh, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, included at the end, as an appendix, these uh, seven books. Um, and you can, there are different interpretations of the history, which uh, Ben will actually be talking about at the end of the semester on uh, why those were later considered canonical by uh, other people. Um, there's also, in addition to those seven books, there's a huge, vast amount of literature written in what's called the Second Temple Period, which is the time uh, following the exile in 587 BC uh, up until the construction of, or uh, the destruction of that um, temple in 70 AD. I think I screwed that up. Those years are right. I don't know if I got the events right. Uh, but between, um, oh, it was the return, the return from exile, uh, and they built a second temple, of course, and then that temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And there was a bunch of other books, uh, the uh, Book of First Enoch, the Book of the Watchers, a uh, bunch of other stuff. And that was important and used by a lot of Christians, but not considered canonical. Uh, and the question of canon is a particularly naughty question that I actually originally had in here, but we had to cut it for time. And you can see we're already kind of pushing it on time. <laughs> so. I have it, yes. So a lot of times in apologetics, when we're talking about the Old Testament, we'll, we'll talk about these scribal copying methods. So do you really need all, these, all this manuscript evidence if you have a really robust scribal copying process, like people usually talk about counting words and counting letters on pages and, and all that sort of stuff? If you do all that, can't you be pretty certain that the text transmission is solid? Yeah, so that's an interesting thing. So the Masoretes, which I have up here, so part of the reason they get their name is because they followed these rules. Oh, the question was about, I, I, I hope everyone heard the question. It was about, um, are the manuscripts of the Old Testament really that important? And what about the scribal transmission methods? Don't they preserve the, the text, uh, 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 a very robust text tradition? So this is a comment about the Masoretes. Um, so let me loop back to a comment I made all the way at the beginning, which was about the non-transferal of Old Testament textual criticism and New Testament textual criticism. So the Masoretes uh, were a group of families, actually, um, that, were sponsor that sponsored uh, some scribes, and they had these very specific rules called Masoras, which detailed very precisely how to copy uh, the biblical text. And it included counting the individual words in every single book of the Bible. Uh, it included the number of letters on each uh, line. It was very sophisticated. Um, and so in order to follow this uh, procedure, you, um, you were highly, I mean, it, it was highly controlled. So there was basically no way you could make an error. Errors were still made, of course, but the rate of error was drastically low. So some people have assumed that this uh, Masoretic tradition was in place during Moses' time. And that is not even close to the truth at all. Uh, and I think that's an example of really bad apologetics, where people will talk a lot, a lot about how these uh, Masoretes were so precise and so specific, and then just casually leave out that Moses didn't even write in Hebrew, more than likely, because that language didn't exist in 1200 BC, uh, and that those things in place were not there. And likewise, the New Testament was not transmitted in that way. Uh, the New Testament was transmitted uh, in what's called a, a free transmission, which meant basically you had a bunch of people that said, hmm, I'd like a copy of that, and they made their personal copy. And then some other people would make a copy, and some other people would make a copy. So it's a very scattered collection. And um, incidentally, that's, there's an argument to be made that that's actually a better way of doing it. Um, 
but because of that, there are a lot more copies. They're a lot more scattered in quality, uh, but they're also uh, very geographically diverse, which is arguably a, a, good, a good thing. So the free transmission and the uh, controlled transmission are one of those two differences. Um, is there some other comment? Oh, the, and, and so because of that, so whenever we talk about interpreting the manuscripts of the Old Testament, we take the Masoretic text as our referent and then basically just look at the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Qumran text and realize that the differences are pretty much negligible um, in most cases. That's not really that big of a discovery, honestly. It just says that we can be reasonably confident that the Masoretic text is fine, and we could just use that. So this Masoretic uh, transmission, this controlled transmission, started in 500 AD? Well, maybe 100 AD, but the, the official, like the Ben Asher family, which is the one that has the, the most uh, manuscripts, they started in 500. Uh, once you start talking about the text, so there's a difference between a text and a material witness. The text of the Masoretic text, like the actual f format that it's in, probably could be pushed back to 100 AD, but um, once these families started like sp officially sponsoring these scribal schools in 500, that's kind of the, the brick wall. But yeah, 500 is a safe number. You won't be wrong if you say 500. Okay. Any other uh, comments or input? I had a comment about the yes, final Dr. form Lawrence. of the so Hebrew Bible. You said that there are traditional positions from the, like the hardcore mosaic authorship. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say the, the death of Moses, because some people aren't hmm. even willing to say that a third party wrote down. Right, yeah. So for death. the death of Moses, uh, let me check my supplementary slides real quick and see if that's in here. Um, okay, it was not. Sorry. Okay, so I'll, I'll quote this from memory and possibly screw this up. By the way, sources and recommendations for stuff. Um, so the Talmud says, uh, Moses, or, uh, God spoke it to Moses and he wrote it with tears. Basically, God uh, directly prophesied to Moses his own death and said, you will die, you will be buried, and no one will know where you uh, are buried. That's what the Talmud says. Um, and there are some Christians who basically take that similar approach. They say that uh, the entire book of Deuteronomy was God prophesying to Moses. Once you get into the land, it's going to be like this. Um, you are going to die, and it's going to be like this. And that's kind of how it goes. Um, and... This is actually something we're going to get into two weeks from now when we start talking about possibility, plausibility, uh, using uh, miraculous, um, uh, having a miraculous intervention uh, and things of that nature. It is certainly cons internally consistent to say those things. Um, it's internally consistent to say that Mo God prophesied to Moses all these things. But as far as the data goes, I think that when we look in the Bible and see actual prophecies and how they're written, it doesn't read like they were prophecies to me. Um, they really just read like updatings. I had a comment oh, about the uh, final there form. There's a comment from the... Zoom, so let me listen in real quick. I had a comment about the final form of the Hebrew Bible. I think that it's most coherent to really care about about what the final form of the Hebrew Bible that we see circa like like 300 to like 200 because there are um, intertextual connections between, for example, the like Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. And that, I would argue, would be evidence mm -hmm. of um, of like later scribes that are trying to stitch together the the entire Tanakh as a like literary uh, like unified work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. So uh, the the comment in the chat was it makes the most sense to look at the Pentateuch as a completed work uh, around uh, five hundred ish BC or two hundred whenever it reaches a final form. Um, and actually, this book right here, the Pentateuch as narrative. Uh, by John Salehammer is an excellent reason, or an excellent way, uh, sorry, an excellent resource for that type of a view. Because, uh, as our uh, uh, commenter here pointed out, there are textual hooks between all of uh, the books, uh, in particular the, the Pentateuch, um, but also the other ones, where there are, four there are foreshadowing things in Deuteronomy, or sorry, there are foreshadowing things in Genesis that happen in Deuteronomy, and they're hooking back into themes from Exodus uh, into Numbers in ways that are very creative uh, narratively. 
Um, so I would recommend that uh, book uh, on, on that point. Um, and, and, and to your point, I think you're exactly right, that it makes the most sense not to look for the original, uh, you know, there's no like original version of Genesis or something that's out there, but rather the Pentateuch through the uh, Hebrew tradition has been woven together, I would say inspired, woven together into a final form and a final, uh, a final version. Is there any, any other comments? Okay, well, these are great uh, conversations, and I'd love to talk with any of you if you want to stick around, but I know that we're a little uh, late on time, so I would like to pivot once again and just tell you a little bit about our scroll, and you can come look at it and some of the rules for it. Um, but first, a preview of next week. This is our Connect slide. Next week, we'll actually be talking not just about the meta context of the Pentateuch, but we'll be talking specifically about Genesis 1 to 11, where we get into the creation and evolution debate, and things of that nature. And you can actually look at Genesis in its original form uh, right over there um, on uh, this scroll here. And so, again, this is a scroll that was uh, rescued from uh, Kristallnacht. Um, and uh, one of the things that's important with uh, these Jew or sorry, with these uh, Torah scrolls is that, broadly speaking, in the Jewish community, um, these are sacred objects, so please treat them in a, in a sacred way. In fact, even right now, like I probably shouldn't have my back uh, towards it, um, but please be very reverent around it. Um, and so for that reason, we ask that you don't touch, most definitely do not touch the text itself, um, but you can touch kind of the back end of the paper on that far end if you, if you like to kind of feel what the uh, material is made out of. Um, and one other thing, too, that's important is that uh, in the Jewish community, these uh, uh, non-kosher scrolls are often, uh, they're used particularly for Holocaust education and awareness. So I think it's very important that this was, in fact, a scroll that was used uh, by the Jewish people, by German Jewish people, that suffered under the Nazi rule. Um, and I think it's not controversial to say that the Holocaust was bad, and it happened. Um, and that this is definitely um, a piece of history that reaches uh, through that terrible time. Um, and I think that it's, it's poignant to reflect on, on that uh, as you're looking at it and also to reflect on uh, being aware that we don't make those mistakes again in the future. So uh, with that, I'll thank you for your time. And uh, I'll be glad to talk with any of y'all about anything, really, if you'd like to stick around as long as you want.